All right. So my man, David Sanchez here says, Hey man, can you describe how Einstein's general theory of relativity fails when referring to the precession of mercury? I have a guy telling me it works just as Einstein predicted, like they always do facepalm. All right. So let's get into the proofs of general relativity. So starting with the first one, right? They, this goes all the way back to Kepler and Newton, right? So Kepler came up with his kinematics to describe the sky which is basically just based off of imperial observation. And then he has a proportional ratio um, based off of the periodicity where that's going to give you the, the distance to your semi-major uh, axis of the elliptical orbit. So that's going to give you your, you know, how far away things are in relation to the sun. So they got this whole system set up, right? And then Newton came along and he was like, hey, if we apply my equations, we can actually attribute a dynamic force of gravity, mass attracting mass, to Kepler's kinematics equations, and it fits that same proportionality constant where we can uh, use those same distances for everything that, that Kepler derived, and everyone, was, and everyone was like, oh, bet, no way. Now, as that was going on, there was a guy named Urbain Laver in 1846 who was taking observations of Mercury for about 40 years. He had 40 years of data and he's saying that Mercury has a little perihelion process to it. So over the course of 100 years, Mercury will process by 1.25 degrees. So basically, if we look at this diagram here, over the course of a century, instead of maintaining a, uh, a, a flat plane of orbit, it starts to tilt up a little bit and go up and down like that uh, by 1.5 degrees over the course of a century, right? So they did their mathematical analysis, right? They, after accounting for all the gravitational forces of all the other planets, so like a perturbation effect, meaning that there would be like a gravitational back and forth with the other planets in the solar system and the sun in regards to Mercury. So it's causing that precession. Now, when they did that, when they applied those calculations to come up with that perturbation, they still had a remaining 43 arc seconds that they couldn't account for. This is the story that they tell us, right? Now, Einstein came along and applies his equations, and he gets the whole 5,600 arc seconds. Now, does that mean relativity is correct? No, that's not even a prediction. These are postdictions, right? They have an observation from with 40 years of data claiming that 100 years out projected from that data, there will be a precession that can't be explained with gravity. Now, the reason it can't be explained with gravity is because the way the orbits work, right, when you're perihelion and aphelion, so... When you're closest to the sun, when you're perihelion, when you're coming around the sun, you're actually locked gravitationally to that exact orbital plane. You can't uh, deviate from it. There can't be an up and down precession because that would imply that gravity isn't the causal mechanism for the displacement, right? So they already added up because there's nothing in space, right? Except it's completely empty. It's just mass of, of celestial bodies and the attractive force between them, right? So they have no other way to explain why this planet is, you know, perturbating in the way it is to cause that precession. So using Einstein's derivation for um, time and distance contracting, right? He applies the periodicity of the event. The coordinate system contracts proportionally to explain the full 5,600 arc seconds. Now, before Einstein proposed this, uh, 17 years prior, there was a guy named Paul Gerber who using a literally identical formalism derived his derivation for, uh, for the perihelion precession using Newtonian mechanics and setting a speed limit on the propagation rate of gravity. Because remember, there's no time variable in Newtonian dynamics for gravity, so it's actually instantaneous action at a distance, but they don't really like to talk about that. But that's the, uh, the issue there. So Gerber comes in with his equation here, and we look at it, we see psi equals 24 pi cubed, times alpha q uh, squared over tau uh, cubed, I'm sorry, over tau squared times c squared minus one or uh, times one minus epsilon squared. So what they're doing there is that the, the only thing that really matters is T, right? T is going to be the periodicity of the event for Einstein. And then the tau for Gerber is going to be how he's locking the gravitational propagation rate to the speed of light. So he's making them the same. Now he doesn't provide an explanation for this. He's just, he's an ether lad, right? He's setting the propagation rate to the, uh, to the fastest thing that they, you know, can, can conceptualize at the time. And they were like, no, you can't do that Gerber. We're, we're not willing to accept that blah, blah, blah. 
Earth's orbital velocity would be reflected if you're using an ether. So we so we can't do with that. So they kind of backburnered your boy. Then Einstein came along with his uh, equation, and it's literally the same thing. And only he, the only thing he changed here is this capital T is now the periodicity of the event. So it's how long it takes for Mercury to complete a circuit around the sun squared. And then that will contract proportionally to the, uh, to his coordinate system, et cetera. Right now, because of their controversy with Gerber and whatnot, this is kind of backburnered and there was a resubmission by a Schwarzschild. Now, Carl Schwarzschild comes in with his, uh, derivation from solving Einstein's field equations. And he's got his own, uh, metric, uh, for how he divvies that up. So what he does is he imposes the conditions on the sun where the sun's a stationary body. It has no electric charge. It has no rotation. It's perfectly symmetrical instead of being oblate, like they say it is. Um, a couple other properties to it. But anyway, and then they attribute um, the properties to Mercury. They say, okay, well, you're actually traveling on a geodesic, meaning, or you're actually traveling on a null geodesic. So they give Mercury the mass and weight of a photon, essentially, and they say that, hey, man, you're just traveling in the, in the, uh, along the curvature of space time due to the gravitation, due to the gravitational field of the sun. So that's how they came up with that. So this is his metric here for all that. And that's what the, all that expresses. So what they're doing, um, is they're just coming up with ways to describe, uh, you know, to, the, a way to impose favorable conditions to do the calculations in the field equations, right? Making the sun stationary, no charge. So it gives an exact amount of gravitational force so that they can impose that on the uh, bending and warping of space time so that that null geodesic will be followed by Mercury and it's uh, and Mercury's mass and weight won't affect anything because if you try to calculate Mercury's mass in this equation, well, space time is going to bend differently and you're not going to be able to account for that perturbation. So these are imposed favorable conditions through metric tensors uh, in the calculus. So what they're doing here is if you can change your boundary conditions or your uh, output conditions, oh, I'm sorry, your input or your boundary conditions. So if you can change your the way you're describing the conservation laws to produce the gravitational field, which they can do, they have different tensors for that. And then the, they can have different space-time curvature tensors, so different outputs. So how much that gravitational field is going to curve space-time, how it's going to affect that. So because you can swap those uh, with different metrics, you can impose whatever conditions you want to solve any any problem and that's kind of the beauty of general relativity right because these field equations are general right they go out to infinity to to solve them you have to rain you have to linearize them to rein them in and then impose conditions on them in which you can uh, start to solve for things so when you get into the perihelion precession and it's like is it correct is it is it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is everything operating how Einstein says it does well, the answer is yes, it is, but it's because of the way the math works. You can impose whatever conditions you want on it. So if we look at the formalism here, Einstein's, you, you know, different derivation, then Gerber comes along with his solution for how he treated the field equations. And it just, it doesn't, um, there's no, the sky's the limit, so to speak, for how correct relativity is when you're dealing with infinity uh, equations that deal with infinity and then you rein them in to impose your own conditions so that you can solve them. So with that said, that's how the perihelion precession was solved, right? Now, the reason that this uh, isn't like a good proof of relativity theory, right, and it requires additional proofs is because it's a post-diction, right? And with the math, yeah, it gives a descriptive mechanism, bending and warping of space-time to the conservation of energy and mass into a gravitational field, which causes the... Um, uh, the bending and warping of this of space time to produce these events, right? So that's a cool story, but they need some physical substance to go along with it. So that's where they get into the deflection of light rays and the gravitational redshift, because this is supposed to explain the behavior of light on, on, on a way that they can analyze it and make, you know, and verify their predictions, right? Because if light is traveling in empty space and it's acting or, you know, it's, it encounters a gravitational field, well, that's going to cause retardation in the light proportional to the strength of the gravitational field. And they would be able to calculate exactly how much frequency is going to be retarded from the light when it's traveling through the gravitational field based off of the strength of the gravitational field, because they have their distribution rates linked to um, Newtonian dynamics right here. So if we look at Einstein's field equations real quick, we can see 
the T Mu uh, T Mu Nu, and then we got eight pi G over C to the fourth. So this eight pi G G to the fourth or C to the fourth is basically the gravitational distribution of the bending and warping of space time. So the gravitational field that comes from T Mu Nu is distributed like a volumetric pressure per cubic centimeter, essentially. And, uh, you know, radially, radially outward at that distribution rate. So it's like how much bending and warping is, is occurring in one cubic centimeter of area, et cetera, right? As it distributes out. And then the G mu, G mu nu on the other side here is how much that bending and warping is going to be caused by that distribution of the graduate of the gravitational field from the T mu nu. And then the lambda G mu nu is for, um, what is it? Uh, cold, dark matter, or whatever. So they just set that to zero. So primarily what we're looking at here is the big G mu nu and this side right here. So we can ignore the lambda G mu nu. All right. So now we got that all taken care of. We got the distribution. We got how it works, how light acts when it's propagating through. And then, yeah, so that's where we get into uh, measuring this, the frequency of light when they break it into that rainbow spectrum here uh, with spectrographs and they start to analyze the frequency shift, they're seeing how much the light was, how much the frequency was retarded in proportional to that um, gravitational uh, field relationship. Now, for like 40 years, they couldn't come up with any consistent readings, et cetera, et cetera. And then that leads into pound repka. But uh, before we get to that, that's the importance of, of the, of what Paul, um, I'm sorry, of what Dr. Silverstein was putting forward at the Royal Astronomical Society meeting where they were talking about, okay, well, we got these equations, we got the gravitational uh, lensing because they said that they saw some displacement near the solar limb of the sun. So they're like, okay, the light moves in that way. Now, what Silverstein points out is in tandem with the lensing observations, there was supposed to be redshift ob observations where they were looking for that, um, that retardation in the frequency proportional to that gravitational field. And they didn't get any readings to correspond to that. So, still, so Silverstein's objects here and he's like, hey man, if we... Like that displacement, you know, if that happened, like I'm not denying it, but we can't attribute it to general relativity because there's no redshift to correspond to the frequency shift that would be required if light interacted with the gravitational field of the sun while it was being displaced. So the phenomenon would have to be attributed to some other causal mechanism. And he goes on to say here that, you know, at the solar limb, there's an electric field, magnetic field, pressure. Who's to say there's dust, gas, who's to say what caused that um, at the solar limb. And he gives Einstein's derivation for the displacement here. And he's saying that, look, man, without the redshift, there's uh, th these equations mean nothing because there's no bending and warping of space time due to the gravitational field. And if that doesn't exist, you can't explain any of the orbits uh, in the Kepler or Newtonian sense meaning like circular or elliptical because a geodesic is a straight line that's supposed to be traveling along curvature of, of space and time. So he's saying if that doesn't, if these redshift observations aren't reflected in here, then this is nothing to be attributed to relativity theory. So then that's where you get into the redshift problem um, where, in, you know, in tandem with that observation and then like 30 years, 40 years out, they were trying to establish a, an agreed upon, way to describe redshift through the math because the math is so generalized. They weren't sure um, if what they were even extrapolating from the field equations was physically meaningful and it took a long time for them to agree upon anything. But then that's where we get into pound Repka and pound Snyder, 1960, 1965 respectively, where they're emitting energy from the top and bottom of a tower and they're trying to measure the frequency shift in relation to earth's gravitational field. And they're saying that at the top of the tower, the energy frequency will be emitted at this amount of frequency. And then as it falls to the bottom, as it's interacting with the gravitational field, it's going to retard or gain, um, uh, gain frequency. It's going to oscillate faster. And in relation to that field, uh, the, 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 the detector that they're using is going to take, it accepts energy inputs of a specific value. So if the energy value doesn't change due to the gravitational potential from the, from the top of the tower to the bottom and vice versa for the detector and emitter, then it won't get the energy reading. But they did get the energy reading, so they were like, okay, bet. So this, mean, this must mean Einstein's gravitational fields call, you know, is proportional to all this and it, you know, the space-time curvature and everything's on the up and up. We're good to go. 
Well, unfortunately, they use Mossbauer detectors for this experiment, and that detector just detecting the energy and then converting it into an electric signal for a pulse rate doesn't tell them if the speed of light changes or anything like that, which is extremely important in relativity theory. So what they, and because the classical prediction makes the same prediction as relativity theory in this, in this regard, right? So the, the frequency shift will happen due to the gravitational field of the earth or the frequency shift will happen due to the photon accelerating as it um, uh, is, is traveling down or resisting as it's going up in proportion to overcoming eight point or was it 9.8 meters per second squared, right? So they had no way to, to, using that detector, they had no way to determine if the, if the light was going faster or if it was traveling at, at its expected speed, but the frequency shift uh, was, was occurring, right? So they suggested, hey, we should get some atomic clocks at the top and bottom here so, and synchronize them so we could time when the signal is sent and when it's um, measured so we can see if it's traveling at the expected propagation rate or if, it's, or if the classical theory is true. Now, they never touched back on that. And then years later, since then, every atomic clock experiment ever done is just is just relating the frequency shift in the clock to the uh, to to gravitational effects. You're right, but the problem with that is is that the atomic clock suffers from the same issue as the Mossbauer detector. It's just converting energy into an electric signal for a pulsation rate. So it's not it can't tell you if the speed of light is changing or not um, in in that regard. So. Uh, that's where I got on to get into linear. Um, that's where we get into interferometry, right? Vertical interferometry, where we can show a phase difference vertically, which means that the light going down versus the light going up is out of phase proportional to the um, to the nine point eight meters per second squared. So, i.e., the answer is the light is changing speed when it's traveling down and when it's traveling up. So it has an isotropic effect. I'm sorry, anisotropic effect. So it changes with direction, right? So going up and down, there's a variance. And going east and west, there's a variance. And in relativity theory, light is supposed to be isotropic, meaning no preferred direction. You could shoot it up, down, left, right, east, west, north, south, no variance. But uh, that's not what's measured, right? So we have the precise, the most precise way to measure light, which is interferometry. And it shows that there is a fringe displacement in the vertical component. And then further, you can get into relative motion through an electric or magnetic field, which produces the retardation or acceleration proportional to the direction of the field that it's, you know, like if it's rotating and you're going with or against it, you're either going to, um, your signal's either going to be retarded or it's going to be extended proportional to that. And that's the Stark and Zeeman effects. So these are known effects that could also retard light proportionally like that. And... It's not mutually exclusive to relativity theory. So that's the full truncated version of the importance of uh, the perihelion precession and the subsequent experiments that follow to really bolster and um, give relativity theory physical meaning because these equations are just abstractions. All right. Thank you for your time and consideration.